Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Assessing Two Decades of Education Reform. Cato's Center for Educational Freedom turns 20, so we're 20 years old this year. Uh, my name is Neil McCluskey. I'm the director of the Center for Educational Freedom. Uh, today, we're going to be chatting a bit about the funding, or the founding, rather, and the mission of the Center for Educational Freedom. Uh, we'll be taking a look at what I think is some real Emmy-level television work by CEF scholars uh, recorded over the last couple of decades. Uh, and I hope we'll be delving into what has been accomplished in education policy, and uh, maybe CEF's role in it in the last 20 years, uh, and maybe talk a little bit about what the next 20 years holds. So see where we've gone and see what still needs to be done. Um, as you saw when you came in, if you are with us in person, uh, we've got a special, I'm gonna hold this up, 20th anniversary, this is 20th anniversary merch. I think the kids say merch these days, some may say swag. Um, so we have this for everybody who's here. Uh, it's got our little CEF at 20 logo. Um, uh, so we have that, if you are here. Uh, we also have just about, I think, every book CEF has published in the last 20 years is out. You probably saw that as you came in. Uh, so we have lots of CEF stuff here that you can take a look at and sort of jog your memory about all that we've done. For those of you who are joining us remotely, you have not been forgotten. Um, if you send us a question or a comment um, on any of the many platforms you could be watching this on, including Twitter, um, if you ask us a question or a comment and I use it, uh, we will send you one of these if I choose your question or comment. Uh, and you can either send your email address through that platform. Um, some of them, it'll just go to our moderator so nobody will see it. But if you're worried someone will see your email address or your snail mail address, you can just send your mailing address to me, to my email, nmcc. L-U-S-K-E-Y at C-A-T-O dot org. So nmccluskey at cato dot org because we want everyone to be a part of this 20th anniversary event. And so now it's my great pleasure to introduce Darcy Olson. Um, although she never actually ran the Center for Educational Freedom, she conceived of it. It was her idea. And as I understand it, she did the vast majority of the legwork to get it up and running. Um, so... I won't give your entire bio, so you can find Darcy Olson on the uh, internet, find lots of bit about her, but I just want to give a couple of highlights, or a few highlights. The first was from 1997 to 2001, and correct me if those years are wrong, but you were the Director of Education and Child Policy here at Cato, and you worked on numerous child-related issues, so not just education, but secretly, you spent most of your time plotting how to create a center that would totally dominate the education policy landscape. That's right, correct? That's exactly what I was doing. Okay, I thought so. Uh, in 2001, though, so before the center actually launched, you took over as the president of the Goldwater Institute, which most of you are probably familiar with, but it's a terrific liberty-oriented think tank in Arizona. And then, again, you can correct my years if I'm wrong. In 2016, you left Goldwater. Uh, and Darcy founded and ran Generation Justice, which I believe was just officially renamed the Center for the Rights of Abused Children just two weeks ago. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, and you can tell us more about it. I I'll just say, I believe the Center fights for the rights of abused children, but you, I'm sure, will have a much better description than I will. But clearly what this indicates is that Darcy cares immensely about children. So welcome, or welcome back, I should say, Darcy Olson. Thank you so much, Neil. It's great to be here. This is, I consider the Cato Institute to be even more my alma mater than my own college, um, having really grown up here in my early 20s, and I'm thrilled to be back for this big celebration. We have a lot, a lot to celebrate uh, um, from the past 20 years. Oh, well, and these mugs will help. Um, so my first question is probably pretty obvious, but why did you want or think it was a good idea to found an education-specific center here at Cato? Well, I, I think I wasn't the only one who thought it was important that we get into the education space. We all felt that way. We'd seen the decline in education in the country and knew what that meant for the future of the country. And um, 
David Bowes at the time uh, was our executive vice president, and he had written a great deal about education reform in the Cato Handbook for Congress and in many other venues. And um, his writing really inspired me, and I saw the vision of where he wanted to take educational freedom. And I remember talking to him about uh, doing more, and he said, Darcy, I'm the executive vice president of the Cato Institute, and I don't have time to run a policy center on education. And so um, we had a conversation, and, and you know, decided that it was time that we that we do that. And uh, we sought some funding and got some very generous support from an organization uh, that's still out there supporting great causes, the Challenge Foundation. And with that funding, we were able to open the education center, and that was um, the beginning of of all the great work that you've done. Great. When you thought of the center, when it was you know, opened, was it, was it your goal mainly to do K through 12 policy or did you envision it doing a whole lot of different things in education? The biggest priority for us was K-12 education just because the failures of the education system for those grades was so bleak. We have a pretty strong higher education marketplace in the country. People come from all over the world to go to school here. So it wasn't as desperate. And there's a lot more diversity in early education than, than there is in K-12, or at least there was. It's of course gotten so much better. So uh, that was the idea to be the main focus. Um, one of the reasons that I, that I left when I did to go to work at the Goldwater Institute was that I wanted to be able to implement some of these policies on the ground. And the Cato Institute, of course, does great theoretical work. And then there are a lot of smaller state organizations that do the implementation. And at that time, I thought that the implementation work was really where it's at, but with with age come a few wrinkles and some wisdom. And I, I would just like to say that there is such a tremendous synergy between the theoretical work on vouchers or savings accounts or to pick any number of ways that you might approach school choice, charter schools, and the on the ground work in the states. When you are in the states moving policy, and we now in Arizona have the largest school choice program, it's universal anywhere in the country, um, it's so wonderful to be able to point to experts here uh, at the Cato Institute and around the country who are writing about these issues on the importance of them, on the small studies that have been done. And likewise, I think the theoretical folks need to be able to point to some on the ground successes. So I think it's not really about what kind of work is better, but just recognizing that those two types of work, the theoretical and the concept that has to go hand in hand with the implementation and that we're a stronger team for it. Mm -hmm. That actually raises an interesting debate that I think we've had within education policy um, and that people often bring up to me and Todd Zwicky is going to talk about this more is uh, people say, well, how can you be for vouchers in K through 12, but not for federal aid in higher education? And I often have to get into a whole discussion of higher ed is bad, but K through 12 is even worse. And so it's interesting that we, uh, that, that, that sort of the thinking of why originally the focus was on K through 12 education. Uh, I do have a very controversial question that probably goes right to the heart of what you were working on at the time. And that continues to be a burning issue in the school choice space, which is, should it be center for educational freedom or education freedom, <laughs> which is a major grammatical question, I think. Uh, I'm just going to say that the freedom word is the most important there uh, and that having all of those options is really uh, game changing. And if I could just give a personal anecdote um, sure. on that. So since I left here, um, I went to the Goldwater Institute. I also became a foster mom. I ended up fostering 10 kids, adopting four. Three of those children have individualized education plans. So they have special learning needs from circumstances of birth. Uh, and I, I don't think I realized how important school choice was until I had kids who, who had different ways of thinking. And we have more and more children like that in our country. Um, and uh, it just makes me very grateful, grateful to be in a state where we have all different sorts of options. Um, but it's, um, you know, it isn't, it isn't just the theory of being able to pick what you might like for your children. It's 
being able to find what that child actually needs to learn. Uh, and when you are a parent or you have one of those kids, this work becomes uh, even more meaningful than, than just the concept of, isn't it important to have these choices in a free country? Of course it is. But it's also, it's also life-changing for children. Mm-hmm. So do you think education policy, especially at the K-12 through level, has gotten a lot better in the last 20 years, or have we not made enough progress? Such a broad question. I think it depends on on where you are uh, as to whether this has impacted you. But I think we've made incredible gains in this country. I, when we were founding the center 20 years ago, I, I certainly didn't think we would have a universal school choice program anywhere in the country in 20 years. I thought we would continue to eke out tiny model programs, Uh, you know, the fight in D.C. for the voucher program that Casey will talk about was an enormous fight with a lot of resources and 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 yet, you know, and it still struggled to to grow despite the need. And I thought that that would be the future of this for a long time. And uh, just this just this year, Arizona passed a universal school choice program. And for the average kid, you get about six thousand dollars and you can take that to any school in the state. So we've got charter schools, purely private schools. We've got the, um, now we have the tax credits where, and then we have these, you know, these cash, you get a card with cash on it and you can go anywhere. And if you live there, um, all of the parents know about these programs. The teachers know. The teachers change schools to find the best school for them that fits their philosophy and fits their lifestyle. Um, so I, I think to see a change like that in your lifetime, I think it's, it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and I consider myself very blessed to have been part of this here and to be on the ground there and to have my children be the recipients of of all the hard work of all the people over the years um, who have worked on this. And, and we, can't, we can't have this conversation also without saying thanks to Milton Friedman for, you know, and what would he think having written on this in the 60s and 70s? So I think he'd be very pleased. Mm-hmm. Yeah, do you think, so 20 years ago, you may not have imagined that it was going to turn out, right now at least, to be so successful. And I think 2021, 2022 have been actually real turning point years, at least so far. Yes. And my father has a saying, it's kind of old school, and he says, you can't see around corners. Mm. And I think that's very true. It's, it's easy to be skeptical. It was easy to see the hard fights. But when you persevere and keep going, um, you learn and you don't know what you don't know. I was not a huge fan of charter schools. I mean, my, my philosophy on charter schools when we founded this center was it's just another version of state run schools and sooner or later they'll be cramped and they won't have the freedom anymore, et cetera, et cetera. What I didn't know is that having a whole bunch of charter schools would get the entire population acclimated to choosing and that once you've chosen a school, you never want to go back to a situation where you don't have a choice anymore uh, and that people would fight to keep the curriculum diverse. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, you know, but you, but you don't, you don't know those things until you walk. So part of, part of an endeavor like this is, is to, to have a vision, but also to have uh, faith uh, a little bit in the unknown and to let things unfold and to let your views evolve uh, as experience uh, uh, proves new things to you. Mm Mm-hmm. One is you unleash freedom. You don't know where it's going to go, but it's generally been in a good direction. Mm -hmm. Well, so obviously you've done a lot since you were at Cato. Can you tell us more about the Center for the Rights of Abused Children? Yes, I would I would love to talk about my children. <laughs> no, yes. So the Center for the Rights of Abused Children is uh, very much akin to uh, the Cato Institute, except we work in the space of, of young children. And, you know, when you're born in this country, you've got two things. You've got your parents and you have the rule of law. And if your parents are abusive to you, if there's rape at home, if, um, if there is trafficking, which mostly occurs within families, one of my own kids was uh, the product of being trafficked, all you have is the rule of law. And so it's critical that people who believe in the rule of law and understand it and understand how it also needs to be limited uh, be involved in this space. And I'll give you just one instance. These children, I took, I 
took my, in my first uh, foster baby who had been abused and abandoned and left behind, and I went into a hearing, the first one, and I looked around the courtroom, and there were attorneys for the government agency that is in charge of this interim space until you either get to go home or you get a new family. And then there was an attorney for the abusive parent who had left behind the child, no parent, but there was an attorney. And I asked the judge, where was the attorney for the child? Well, there was no attorney for the child because they they don't have that right. So this is a country where in the Constitution, the criminally accused have the right to an attorney because their life and, right, their lives and liberty interests are on the line. Well, so too it is for these young children. And so we are fighting for them. We just got them attorneys last year in our state, and we'll be working on some of those things here as well. Um, But life and liberty are just as important to little ones. And although they they don't have the capacity to exercise their freedom the way adults do, um, certainly they have the same basic human rights. And that's what the Center for the Rights of Abused Children is all about. Terrific. Um, well, thank you, Darcy, for, first of all, being with us today, but also for doing all the work it took to launch this center, um, which I hope is continuing to do what you had in mind when you were working on the idea that Cato needs something committed to education policy. It's, it's a joy to see, and it couldn't be in better hands. Neil, thank you for having me today. Sure. Well, thank you. Uh, And now, so that you can all sort of see what we've been up to over the years, uh, we have basically uh, video highlights from starting about 20 years ago of folks at the Center for Educational Freedom talking about all sorts of educational issues. So I hope you'll enjoy these sort of captivating CEF TV highlights, uh, and then we'll be up with our next panel. I think the only way to really change what's going on in Detroit and a lot of other uh, big cities are in almost as bad shape, not quite as bad as Detroit is, is to have uh, full school choice between private and uh, public schools, uh, allowing children to take either vouchers or education tax credit funded scholarships to uh, the school of their choice, whether that's private or public. That conference resulted in the book which we have just released entitled Educational Freedom in Urban America, Brown v. Board After Half a Century. Uh, The book examines the history of Brown v. Board of Education and admittedly paints a fairly dismal picture of the quality of educational um, uh, practice in America's urban centers. The remedy to America's educational challenges, according to the authors, does not lie in more government, but instead lies in giving parents, particularly inner-city parents, greater educational freedom. Inner city parents lack the ability in many cases to select good schools for their children and forcing children to attend inferior public schools when better schools, either better public schools or private schools, are available, often right in their own neighborhoods, goes against the spirit of Brown v. Board. Why are school vouchers a good idea? Okay, I'd say for three main reasons. The first one is that I think uh, within the education field, people have come to the realization that one size does not fit all. That you cannot design the one best system that's going to work for everyone. So what you need to do is to offer a variety of options to to children, to, uh, to see what works best for them. So, you know, give them something to allow them to go out into the system and to find the best possible education for themselves. A couple of years ago, I did a study that looked at all the scientific research comparing different kinds of school systems around the world. And what I found is that the ones that worked the best consistently across all the different outcomes uh, scientists measured were the ones that looked the most like competitive, free enterprise systems. So the more market incentives were unleashed, the more consumer choice there is, the better schools okay. work. It turns out education is just not that different. We shouldn't expect that all students who happen to live in a certain geographical area are going to have their needs met by one school. Yes. And uh, you know, even in a given family, you'll find that there are some students that thrive in the public schools, and then there are others who need something else that perhaps a private school can offer. And so what we really want is to move away from the sort of top-down, one-size-fits-all or one-size-fits-few model that we've had ever since the industrial era and move into the 21st century, you know, the iPod generation, where you can tailor 
uh, and education to every individual child. I think that's the direction we want to go and so this scholarship tax credit program helps us get there. But in recent months, No Child Left Behind has been the focus of an unprecedented bipartisan revolt among state lawmakers who argue that it has become a prescriptive regulatory nightmare rather than the flexible reform promised. That the act has been accompanied by huge federal spending increases is incontestable. The federal education budget rose by 49% in President Bush's first term, leaving congressional staffers to name the act, no dollar left unspent. Well, you know, the problem isn't that we don't have good ideas in the United States. You can find a lot of good examples, you know, a lot of good individual schools around the country. Uh, this one school uh, is, is no exception. The problem is we don't have a system that identifies good schools and then helps to encourage them and helps to, uh, you know, reproduce their successes around the country. Often enough is school choice can really benefit teachers and educators alike. Uh, because in the current system, if you want to be a teacher at the K-12 level, you have one employer, the government. It's essentially a monopsony. Uh, and so we hear monopoly a lot, but monopsony is when there's one seller of the service, mm -hmm. one producer. So uh, in, a, school of in a, a system of private school choice, it introduces more competition to acquire bet good teachers. So like in the Hogwans in South Korea, someone, someone over there is getting paid millions of dollars, uh, four or five million a year. Uh, because there's a, a system of choice over there. But the good news is we've had people who've been homeschooling for a very long time, and they have vetted lots of different things that you can use, even if your school doesn't provide you things that you as a parent can go to, and they will give you instructional materials, places like Khan Academy and Prodigy Math and other sort of online outlets like that. The Cato Institute, my favorite institute, by the way, lays this out. It says there are several reasons federal student debt cancellation is a bad idea. First, it helps the winners, those who made the decision to go outrageously to go out to, uh, to, go out to outrageously overpriced colleges and get a degree. And the higher the degree they earned, the more money they will make and supposed to pay off their debts. Wouldn't you think that? It's not like those doctors will give you a rebate when your colonoscopy pays for their Mercedes. Follow that for a second, there's no coupon available. It's also regressive, as more of the aid would go to the highest earners than the lowest. Again, giving money back to those who need it the least. How does that make sense? Not to mention the huge cost to taxpayers. I mean, the evidence is pretty clear that Colleges are always looking for money because they always see something they think is important to do. Mm -hmm. And as long as the federal government supplies lots of loans and also grants, but the loans are the biggest problems, and tax credits and lots of other uh, aid to students, the schools will always look to those students as a source of funding. Even now with all this money flooding in, so many schools are still doing this and they're sending these kids home after, you know, we're going, this is our fourth year now of interruptions. Now, Neil McCluskey is the director at the Cato Institute Center for Educational Freedom and holds a PhD in public policy and is the author of Unprofitable Schooling. We really do need perspective on this. Now, we don't know exactly how it's gonna play out. The administration didn't give any estimates, in part because they probably don't know, and in part because they may not want people thinking about $500 billion. But when the government has a huge debt, and it then says, don't repay us $500 billion, that is money that eventually someone has to pay for. Thank you very much. Um, so I hope you enjoyed that trip sort of through the years of CEF. Uh, if nothing else, and actually Colleen had a lot to do with putting this together, but as I noticed when we were going through Eclipse, if we learn nothing else, it's that the ability to capture video and put it on the internet sure has gotten a lot better in the last 20 years because some of that stuff was pretty darn grainy. Um, uh, 
It, I uh, should also mention it was great to see Andrew Coulson again. Andrew Coulson was my predecessor, and, and many of you probably know he was taken from us uh, far too young. So it was great to see him again uh, at providing the sort of analysis that he did so well. Uh, I also want to thank Jonathan Fields, who's the director of audiovisual production, and David Tassi, who's the senior audiovisual engineer, for putting this together because they're the ones who took a lot of that old grainy footage and made it look, I thought, pretty new. So to me, that's very impressive. Maybe it's because I'm technologically slow, but I was very impressed. Um, and also, I should say, speaking, you know, we're talking about internet video, that is a reminder that. Um, if you are joining us online, uh, that you can submit questions or comments to us. If you're on Twitter, use hashtag CatoCEF. And again, if we use them, we'll make sure that you get sent one of these, oh, nice uh, Cato CEF at 20 collapsible mugs. Uh, now, it's my great uh, pleasure to introduce to you uh, a panel of CEF, former analysts, present analysts, all friends of the center, um, and we're going to talk about how education policy at all levels, so pre-K, K through 12, higher education has changed in the last 20 years, has it gotten better, has it gotten worse, and talk about what CEF's role has been in that. Um, I'm going to give just short bios for each person. Again, like Darcy, you can find a whole lot about them on the internet, but I'll just sort of highlight a few things for each one of them. I'll start on my right with Casey Lartigue. Uh, Casey was with Cato from 1998 to 2004, mm -hmm. including as, was it the first policy analyst for the uh, Center for Education? Hired at the same time. Okay, so one of the first CEF policy analysts. Um, and he was, among many things, the co-editor of this book, which is still, we have it outside. I think we have some that you can still purchase. This is Educational Freedom in Urban America, Brown v. Board After Half a Century. Um, and he co-edited that. Uh, he currently lives in South Korea, so he came a very long way to be with us today. And we appreciate that. He is the co-founder and co-president of Freedom Speakers International, which was formerly the Teach North Korean Refugees Global Education Center. Is that correct? Okay, good. Um, and he is the co-author of the new book, Greenlight to Freedom, A North Korean Daughter's Search for Her Mom and Herself. Uh, and I was, uh, before I was at Cato, I was at a place called the Center for Education Reform, and I remember reading about the D.C. voucher program fight and seeing your name all the time and mm. thinking, this Casey Lartigue is just killing it. <laughs> um, so, and then it was really exciting. I got to actually meet you, okay. which was the highlight of my life. <laughs> I, I overspoke on that a little, but it was really good to meet you. Um, then uh, to his right is Todd Zwicky. Uh, among many things, Todd is the George Mason University Foundation Professor of Law at the George Mason University Antonin Scalia School of Law and was recently a senior fellow at the Cato Institute's Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. Perhaps more important for our purposes, and I'll have to ask you to hold this too, I'm going to drop everything. Um, he is the co-editor with me of this book, Unprofitable Schooling, examining causes of and fixes for America's broken ivory tower. And if I'm going to be totally honest with everybody, Todd did almost all of the work for that book. He commissioned, I think, all the papers that became chapters. Uh, it was all, the book was his idea, and I just did some of the nug work to kind of get it all put together. Uh, you'll also note that the book you probably saw it was on the Dr. Phil show. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Phil said I was the author. I'm just the co-editor of what was mainly Todd's book. But it was very interesting. To, so Dr. Phil talk, tackled, talked about the book, uh, and I want to quote this exactly. He tackled whether the book's, quote, drama queen ways are wreaking havoc on its family. That's a real Dr. Phil topic, but I guess... <laughs> People don't see it applicable to a book. Um, for those who follow higher ed governance uh, particularly closely, you might also recall Todd's roller coaster ride on the Dartmouth College Board of Trustees. I imagine that's given you lots of insights into how higher education works or does not work. Uh, finally, on my left is Colleen Hronczyk. She's the latest addition to the CEF family. She has uh, joined us as a policy analyst last year. So I think one year was in August, right? Yeah. Um, so she's a homeschooling mom. 
uh, and was at the Commonwealth Foundation before she joined Cato. Uh, most of her work is on K-12 through education. Uh, she also writes what I think is a wonderful uh, kind of new product that we have, the Friday feature, which appears every Friday on Cato's blog, and it sort of highlights uh, innovative educational options that are already in existence that maybe people don't know about, uh, and talks about how if we had more school choice, those would proliferate even further, how these tremendous innovative options would be available to far more people. Uh, she also, though, covers early childhood education for us and is the author of the recent policy analysis, which you can find outside, Universal Preschool Lawmakers Should Approach with Caution. And I should ask, do we have any baseball fans out there? You can raise your hand if you're a baseball fan. Okay. We have some baseball fans. Any of you Pirates fans? No. no. Oh. <laughs> it's, oh, we have one Pirates fan. Uh, um, so... Uh, it's unfortunate you said no so loudly when you said you weren't. But uh, if you are a Pirates fan or just a baseball fan, you may know Colleen's grandfather, World Series winning player and manager Danny Murtaugh, um, and, about whom Colleen actually wrote a book, uh, was it maybe 10 years ago or so, called The Whistling Irishman Danny Murtaugh Remembered. So if you're baseball fans and even if you're not a big Pirates fan. Oh, so it's still interesting. Oh, good. So, you don't have to be a Pirates fan to, to know Danny Murtaugh. So, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, and Casey, I'd like to start with you, uh, in part because you were here at the start. Um, as I mentioned, I saw you a lot working on school choice in D.C., um, which was one of the earliest voucher programs that we had in the country. And I'd be really interested for you to just tell us what was it like to work on getting that program launched. Okay, uh, it was a war. Um, there were lots of interest groups that really wanted to get this um, thing passed, it, um, get school choice for kids in Washington, D.C. Um, I'll start with what happened with me, that I was investigated by people in the school system. I received warnings that I had to watch myself because people in the school system were really disturbed by what I was doing. And what was I doing? I was connecting directly with the parents in the schools. I had some uh, parents ask me if I could come to their schools and investigate the school budgets. And I'm just admitting, I don't know anything about a school budget, but they said, you are with the big Cato Institute, they will be scared, just the fact that you showed up there. Okay. So it was, for me, a lot of things were going on. Uh, the, the school board president came to a Cato Institute event and attacked me. But it was actually one of the turning points in the move to get school choice in Washington, D.C. Because she attacked me, but I show some of the quotes that she had said about parents in Washington, D.C. Um, that they don't, what was it, that they don't know how to make decisions for themselves there's no way they'll be able to choose a good school for their own children. And by the end of the event, during the Q&A period, two things happened. First of all, Bill Niskanen stood up and defended the paper, saying if there's a single mistake in this paper, that Cato would issue a public apology. Now, I wasn't that confident, <laughs> actually, in the paper, uh, as, as much as he was. But the second thing is that some of the low-income mothers that I'd been working with, Virginia, with Virginia Walden Ford and with others, they stood up, defended me, and criticized the school board president, who was then in a very uncomfortable position of having some of the parents in the school district attack her. Four months later, well, um, at the end of the event during the reception, she apologized to the parents and said that I've never had a parent ask me for school choice. I'll look into it. Four months later, school board president reversed herself publicly. That led to the mayor of Washington, D.C. coming out in favor of school choice. The city council chair came out in favor of school choice. And even Marion Barry, the former mayor of the city, came out in favor of school choice. It was a war, but because the city leaders got behind it, um, uh, it was possible to create this voucher program. Um, now, I asked Marion Barry 
Now, Marion Barry was mayor in 1981 when there was an effort to have a tuition tax credit, refer, uh, tuition tax credit for Washington, D.C. residents. It was voted down 89% to 11 by city residents. So 1981, he led that effort. I asked him what was different in 2003, 2004, and to quote him, in a triple negative perhaps, he said, in 1981, didn't nobody give us no money? <laughs> okay, all right, I think everybody understood what he was saying, all right? Okay, didn't nobody give us no money? Now, in 2003 and 2004, what had happened is that we had come up with a strategy with, which we call the three-sector strategy, and that is that the public schools would get money, the private schools would get this um, voucher program established, and charter schools would also be established in the district. Okay? Now, the money was basically going to be thrown away in the public schools. I mean, about three days, the money's gone. Okay? But at the end, uh, city leaders and others came out in support of it. And a big part of it was because of the event that was held at the Cato Institute. I won't say it was the only thing, but it was a major turning point in getting city leaders to change their minds. Uh, there were other things that had happened, and I think the other really key thing I'd like to point out is that Howard Fuller established the Black Alliance for Educational Options. Now, this was significant because, I mean, he was a radical from the 60s. In 1987, he attempted, uh, attempted to start a separate school district for black children in Milwaukee. He established Bayo in 2000, and he made the effort to recruit every black person in the country who was for school choice into his organization. We were holding separate meetings, separate from everything, that, uh, everything else that was happening, to network to see, can we get this thing done? Okay. And I think that that was actually one of the key points because my role was to connect with the think tank scholars and the academics and uh, let them know why, why it's important. Even though this thing was not perfect, it's going to be flawed, but that would be better to have it passed. Okay. So after two years of tremendous fights, then the, um, the legislation was approved by Congress in early 2004, and then that was the beginning of the school voucher program. Great, thanks. We'll ask you more about you know, how school choice is going, but it, that was quite a battle, and I sort of wonder if battles have hopefully gotten a little less severe, although I'm not optimistic that's the case. Uh, but Todd, I wanted to ask you now, go into higher education. When I first arrived at CEF, um, uh, there was a, I, I wasn't, we weren't doing a whole lot on higher ed, but a report came on my desk, it was from a congressional subcommittee called the College Cost Crisis, and it had this table I would never forget where they had one column that said, well, every year we increase student aid by X amount. And then every year, the following year, I guess, tuition or prices go up X plus one. And we're really upset because we don't feel like we can ever catch up to tuition. We don't know why. Why does this keep happening? And I thought, well, I can look at that, that chart and say, well, probably because aid fuels tuition increases. And that was really something people weren't talking about a lot. Um, and we started talking about it. But that then sent me down the rabbit hole of all sorts of problems in higher education. And I was hoping that you could talk about, you know, have, has, have, has anything gotten better in higher education in the last 20 years? Um, has it all gotten worse? Sort of what's the state of play in higher ed versus 20 years ago? Um, well, I, th I don't think anybody could argue with a serious face that things have gotten better. Um, I think by all measures, it's gotten worse in terms of out, uh, outcomes, cost, everything else. And I think part of that, of course, is um, cultural, which is the rise of cancel culture and the intolerance of speech uh, and the like, which is more cultural, I think, than anything. And that probably goes back to what you guys study in K-12, because students seem to be coming to college already primed uh, to be offended um, and the like. But I do think that there are some structural things um, that we've seen over the, t uh, the last 20 years. There's really the playing out of, of fundamental problems with the way in which higher education is uh, organized. Uh, uh, um, and it's just been a, a slow motion train wreck kind of seeing how it does it. And we talk about this in the book, uh, which is that if you wanted to create a recipe for um, a, a poor system that delivers 
any product uh, in, uh, in any economy, you would uh, create a system that suppresses competition and increases government regulation and subsidies. Um, and that's basically what we have managed to do with the higher education system is more or less turn it into the healthcare system uh, of a system of essentially third party payer uh, that drives uh, strange cost structures and then drives government regulation on the, uh, on, on the back end. So if we first look at government intervention in the higher higher education system. As you said, it's now pretty much established um, after a, a lot of time studies, but particularly a study from the New York Fed a few years ago, that a, as you said, Neil, uh, the more we try to make college affordable, the less affordable it becomes. Uh, that um, dumping sits the money into the system, subsidies, student loans, all that sort of stuff. Uh, the estimate is about um, 65 cents out of every dollar in increased uh, financial support uh, just goes into higher tuition. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I'm on the other side of that. I'm a professor, so I'm not going to complain too much about it. Uh, but now that I'm about to become a tuition payer as my daughter gets ready to college, now I'm, I'm, I'm not quite as keen on that uh, racket. Uh, but, um, but that's basically what you get when you get a system that is subsidized uh, like that. What you get are cost increases, especially in something like higher education where you have somewhat of an inelastic um, supply curve. Uh, the second thing that we see is uh, really comprehensive government regulation um, and uh, here we see more and more sort of direct uh, regulation uh, but the real culprit here is um, accreditation um, and accreditation itself and the stranglehold that the accreditation system puts over higher education is a result itself of the third party payer structure that we've created in higher education which is that it goes back to the well-intentioned GI Bill, um, and when they had the G, and we, uh, there's a chapter in the book that talks about this. When we had the GI Bill after World War II, they were going to send the GIs to uh, to get a college education. Well, a lot of them wanted a college degree, but not a college education. Uh, so there were plenty of um, universities, uh, diploma mills that sprung up, basically to take people's money or not their money, the taxpayer's money, uh, so that people could get a degree without actually going to school, more or less. So when they reauthorized the GI Bill after the Korean War, they basically said, we need to figure out who the real universities are. They glommed on to the accreditation system that was existing then, and now it's become basically the tail that wags the dog because the accreditation system controls access to all this federal largesse and everything else that you have in the, uh, uh, in, in the system, right? That all goes back to the idea that people weren't using their own money anymore to go to college. It's inherent in basically a third-party payer system that then you get this misalignment uh, uh, between um, what you demand and what, you're, uh, what you actually have to pay for. And so now accreditation has become the Goliath that basically stifles any new business models, stifles entry in the higher education profession. And more and more what we're seeing now is the accreditation cartel basically sitting on novel uh, enterprises, while at the same time then traditional universities basically gobble up new markets uh, by putting their programs online uh, and that sort of thing. But the idea of low cost alternative ways of providing higher education um, are really caught up uh, in many ways um, on the accreditation system. Uh, the accreditation system controls things like the ability to transfer credits and everything else. And so, um, and so the real question, the other half of that is, is how do we bring competition to the system? We know that in every market we know of, Competition and consumer choice is the vehicle by which we get increased quality, increased innovation, increased consumer uh, satisfaction, and lower prices. And my guess would be that we would see the same thing uh, in the higher education system if we could clear out these barriers to competition. Instead, what we are getting the op is the opposite. So, for example, um, over the last uh, uh, few years, but particularly during the Obama administration, we essentially saw an all-out war on for-profit colleges. Uh, for-profit colleges being uh, very nimble providers of higher education, particularly skills-based uh, uh, education. We describe how that works in the, uh, in, in the book. Um, at the same time, we've got this kind of, I think, patronizing, really kind of, I don't know, disgusting sort of patronizing view of community colleges, which is 
come on, folks, most community colleges in this country just aren't very good. Um, and the idea is that we'll just put more money in the community colleges and the like without actually seeing whether they're doing uh, anything. The reason why we have for-profit colleges to a large extent is because community colleges fail so many of their students. And now the idea is, well, we'll just give more money to community colleges, let everybody go to community colleges for free, which would basically you know, make community colleges even less effective uh, uh, for, for everybody. So the response to all this is more subsidies, right, uh, um, and, 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 and things like that, rather than trying to think how we introduce more competition into the system. Uh, the last thing is that we've got to come up with something that deals with this problem of over-credentialism. We've got this, this rise in credentialism. A lot of that is driven by things like occupational licensing requirements, right, um, and various uh, rent-seeking and special interest elements in the economy that have led people to get college degrees so they don't need a college degree, uh, to get unnecessary degrees in order to become you know, to become just about any licensed profession in the economy. I heard recently daycare workers in D.C. Uh, apparently are soon going to be required to have a, um, uh, a college degree. Is that right? I mean, this is just madness, right? Um, and it's just driven by some vehicle that, that creates this over demand for, uh, for credentials um, and, uh, um, and further, um, I think, uh, drives this, this cost spiral. Um, and that ends up falling back on the back of uh, students. Um, and then, of course, at the end, what do they want to do then is when students have to borrow money in order to do it, now the government will come back in again and just forgive all their debts. So the cycle just continues. So I think that all of this logic is inherent in a system that's dependent on government regulation, government subsidies, and suppression of competition. And so I think all the principles that CEF has always stood for is really the way forward and really the only way to fix this broken system. Thanks. It makes it a lot harder to say, well, uh, you know, higher ed is terrible, but K through 12 is worse, <laughs> because that would really spend you in a spiral of depression after we heard about higher ed. So maybe we have some better news in early childhood education or pre-K, people have different terms for it. Uh, it strikes me that maybe, you know, this topic comes up, it goes away, it's never sort of in the forefront of education policy. It, over the last 20 years, have things gotten better in pre-K, worse? Well, it's funny to hear all these complaints about K-12 and higher ed and think the solution must be more government involvement in early childhood education. <laughs> and I think that's why it comes and goes. It's because deep down, maybe people do realize this, so it sounds great, and people think, oh, I could get this paid for. But then when they look deeper into it, they realize that all these same problems that we're seeing in the other education sectors, we're going to start seeing in early childhood education if we go down this road. So it, it seems like the fact that it hasn't happened yet is a positive. It's the same, you can look back 20 years ago and see the same exact arguments being made for and against it, but so far the against it side is winning, so I think that's positive. And do you think CF has had a role in sort of keeping universal pre-K at bay? Well, let's just say that Biden dropped his uh, universal preschool plan right as our policy analysis came out, so I don't know. <laughs> well, I think that's pretty definitive proof that we have caused uh, or we protected everybody from universal pre-K. I think the consistency of Cato's voice on this has definitely been important. You know, throughout the years, we've never wavered on, you know, the scholars here have never wavered on the fact that this is not the road that we should go down whether it's because it's not constitutional or it's not effective or it would be very expensive or it would mess up the system just like these other systems have been messed up. The bottom line is don't do it and so far it's working. Mm -hmm. uh, Casey, I just wanna ask you a question because we're talking a lot about choice and empowering people to make decisions, although ideally they're doing it increasingly with their own funds. But uh, you, you were saying something that we were you know, having dinner last night you said some interesting things about what you've observed both uh, about school choice and then the work that you do now. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about what you do now and then that connection you made. Yeah, okay, well, uh, yes, I live in South Korea and thank you very much to the Cato Institute for bringing me here for this event. Uh, very happy to be invited back. Uh, I have an organization, it's called Freedom Speakers International, and we work with North Korean refugees, help them with learning English, public speaking, and with career development. Um, about 500 have studied with us since we started this in 2013. Uh, my co-founder is a South Korean researcher named Lee Eun-gu. 
Uh, one interesting thing that I noticed is that when I was here working on education in D.C., a lot of people were saying that parents cannot make decisions on their own, that if they have a voucher, what are they going to do? They don't understand the process of selecting a good school and which school is good for their children. Uh, so actually, I spent a bit of time trying to refute that and came up with some interesting data back then, such as uh, Washington, D.C., at least at that time, had what they call the Outer Boundary Program. And this means that a child can choose a school outside of their immediate area. So we looked at this to see, well, what are the choices that parents are making now within the system? At Woodrow Wilson, there were zero spaces available for students to transfer into the school, but more than 500 families um, applied to go there. Deal High School, which feeds into it, had 10 spaces available, and they had more than 500 people also apply for that, even though they knew it was unlikely for them to get into the school. On the other hand, Blue High School had 220 spaces available, and they had three applicants. Okay? And there were other schools in similar situations, mainly Ward 7 and Ward 8, that they had many spaces available, but nobody was applying there. So when they were saying that the parents don't know about which schools are good and which ones were not, all you had to do is look at what they were, um, what, which places they were trying to go to and which ones they were fighting to get into. Okay? Now, we can hear that probably even now that parents can't really decide, especially lower income parents. Then I go over to South Korea and I'm working with North Korean refugees and I'm hearing some of the same kind of language from people. And that is that North Korean refugees cannot really decide for themselves. They come from a communist country. So if you, I mean, they, they can't choose for themselves. But anyway, I decided to try with the program that I was operating in South Korea and that would give North Korean refugees the chance to choose their own tutors, to choose what it is that they want to study. And well, what do you know? like lions chasing after deer. I mean, they were just so aggressive. Um, and we had like one you know, memorable case that we would start our sessions at 2 p.m. at which the refugees could choose the volunteers. Our earliest arrival got there at 1 a.m. Okay? Because she wanted to choose first. We have others, they're just chasing us for the opportunity to be able to study. And they learn that they are able to, that they've got the power to choose. So I saw a similar thing in South Korea as, as compared to the USA where the intellectuals and the elite and others are just so sure that people cannot choose for themselves. But when you give them the power to choose, oh yeah, they exercise it, um, happily so. Terrific. So the, the way I sort of see it, the broad mission of the Center for Educational Freedom is to move more and more to basically decentralized control of education, both in terms of, you know, who decides what schools or colleges or, or pre-Ks do, uh, and to increasingly have the money following individual decisions and preferably people using much of their own money for these decisions. Do you think that we're further away from that version in each of these areas of education than we were in 2002? Are we further away? Or are we getting closer? And, or do you think it varies from level to level? And we'll just start with Todd with how you think we're doing in higher ed, although unfortunately I think I know. <laughs> and then we'll just work our way down. Yeah, I think we're, we're, we're doing worse. And, and, and it's very, it is very much like the healthcare system, which is kind of using the idea of keeping down costs and controlling costs is, uh, and affordability uh, as the mechanism for controlling the entire system. Um, and, um, and we've ended up with sort of a perverse form of competition in that market where this gusher of money of subsidies comes in. And the evidence is pretty clear on this, that money is not going into the classroom, uh, that money is not going into improving education. It's basically bread and circuses. Um, it, is, um, it really is going into fancy buildings uh, funded by debt, uh, federally te you know, subsidized debt uh, because capital improvements by nonprofits are um, tax uh, subsidized. Uh, but it's also going into this army of bureaucrats. Um, and anybody who's been around a university knows, uh, know, knows this. It reminds me of um, a story perhaps apocryphal. J uh, Kennedy visited um, Pope John uh, the 23rd uh, when he became president. And he said, how many people work in the Vatican? And Pope John said, about half. Um, and that, uh, that basically seems to be what goes on with uh, bureaucrats in higher education. Uh, what we, universities are very weird places. I mean, they have 
they have healthcare systems. They every, every, why does every university have a football field and a soccer field and you know they provide all these sort of entertainment amenities and that sort of thing that only that are that it's not quite clear why why we're doing all of this, but what we do know is it's driving up costs uh, uh, and, and the like. And so to the extent we get competition, we get competition on these very weird margins um, that are the kind of things you would expect to see in a market that is distorted as uh, this market is uh, distorted right now. Mm -hmm. Casey, you've been looking at this maybe more casually from a greater distance. So, but from that vantage point, do you think we're doing better or worse, at least in K through 12 education, decentralizing and having the people the schools are supposed to serve control the money? Yeah, you're right. I haven't been paying attention to what's been going on in American education since about 2009. So, uh, but one thing that it interests me, you mentioned that almost there are almost 80 voucher programs mm -hmm. Across the U.S., um, and that is an achievement because it was 12 or so back when I was focused on this. Um, thought there might be more still. I mean, but still, 80, almost 80 seems to be a pretty good number. Uh, well, I think you're always going to have the battle that people don't expect to have to pay for the education of the children. Uh, I think it's just one of the realities. Uh, I'm not saying for good or bad. I think it's just one of those realities. Um, and if you expect them to pay, they're going to protest against you or whatever it is. Um, but I, I'll mention one thing, though I was also on the executive board of the Washington Scholarship Fund before it was rolled into this voucher program, and the low-income parents were expected to pay something um, towards the um, tuition for the, um, at, at the different schools. So about, I forgot what percentage, maybe 50 to 70 percent would be covered by the scholarship that they would receive, but they were willing to do it. Okay? because they knew they were getting something better. Perhaps if people thought they were getting something better, they'd be more willing to pay more now, but the way things are now, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. things that people still expect that it will all be for free. Mm -hmm. All right, Colleen, you can answer that for pre-K or K through 12, whether you think we're heading more toward the vision of what education should look like. Well, I think in K-12, the difference is, and a lot of people will think, oh, well, how come you push uh, vouchers or ESAs in K-12 when you're arguing against the same sort of thing in preschool or higher ed. And the difference is every state constitution mandates something about uh, the provision of the funding of and compulsory attendance for K-12. So, you know, in the K-12 sphere, having that funding follow the students is probably really the best that we can do for the most part right now. In preschool, it's much different because we don't have those provisions. We don't have that history. So uh, I think we are still in largely in a space where parents see that they are doing that themselves. They don't seem to be happy about it necessarily. But uh, you know, I think at the federal level, at least, we seem to be resisting it. And then a lot of states are taking the lead, or cities, larger cities, are doing this. And that's definitely a better sphere for that to be happening because the more local it is, of course, then the more those communities can weigh in on what it should look like versus doing something at the DC level, and it's gonna be very bureaucratic, it's not gonna meet the needs of most people, it's gonna drive a lot of the smaller preferred providers out of business. So I think the fact that this is happening more at the city level and the state level versus the DC level is a good thing for, for pre-K. Yeah, and I'll just chime in because I keep forgetting to mention this. One of the things we've worked on on and off for a long time was shrinking the federal role in education. Uh, and I will say that in 2002, so about a year before I started here, we had the No Child Left Behind Act, which was very highly prescriptive. Um, and we were pretty consistent opponents of that, trying to explain why you don't want centralized control over what kids learn, uh, how schools are held accountable. And I'm sure CEF had a major role in this. And in 2015, uh, the law was reauthorized as the Every Student Succeeds Act, and it actually reduced the amount of federal control in uh, education, or at least K through 12 education. And I think that that is kind of a major accomplishment Actually, we didn't accomplish it all by ourselves. No Child Left Behind made a lot of people angry, but I think we were consistent from the beginning in saying that this is not consistent with the, constitutional, or with the Constitution or with good education policy. And I was 
Uh, you know, 2014, I used to be resigned to the idea that, well, government is always going to get bigger and always have more control, and I can sort of yell at it and slow it down, but I can't reverse it. But we did actually have a reversal of big government in 2015. So I take that as a victory. Um, I'll start with you, Colleen, and then we'll just go the other direction. What do you see happening in the next 20 years, and maybe what should the center be focusing on to try and stop bad things or to promote good things? Well, in the pre-K, I think largely it is just education. And a lot of times people who are supporting this expansion, they will talk about polls, say, oh, well, polls show the parents support universal preschool. But they never define what that means. And I think that if they did, they would find that what parents want is much different than what, say, a Biden administration proposes in terms of the mandates. So I think that's on the pre-K level, what we need to do is just really educate parents and let them know what the impact of these programs from the DC level would be like. And on K-12, I think it's very optimistic. You know, what we saw in Arizona and West Virginia, where it's nearly universal there for the education savings accounts, where you actually are having the state funding follow the students. But even in states like I've been in contact with a mom in Oregon, and she's part of an effort to get ballot measures put on to get school choice and open enrollment in Oregon because they've pretty much given up on their politicians. So they're trying to do more of a parent-led effort and put it right to the voters. And every single poll I ever see, you've got 70 plus percent support pretty much across the board, whether it's by race, by political party, by gender. So I, I think that maybe more states will look at options like that to get these programs passed when their politicians are not willing to do it. Mm -hmm. Katie, did you want to say anything? Uh, or even sure, based on sure. your experience in Korea? Uh, well, I'm going to give a sound bite to the conspiracy theorists who hate Cato uh, to say refute and confuse. And by refute, until you refute the arguments that people make against school choice, uh, I think still it's going to be limited. Uh, and I'll just give the example with DC in the past. Uh, one of the, the major arguments they kept running into is people keep uh, people kept saying, "You're stealing money from the public schools." It didn't matter what else, we, uh, whatever we said, they will come back to you're stealing money from the public schools. Well, the legislation for the DC voucher program actually put money in the public schools. Again, I'm not saying it's a great thing um, that the money would have been wasted within the, just a couple of days. But until we refuted that argument, people would not listen. And as I said earlier, the city leaders would not come on board. And across the board, we couldn't have gotten the legislation passed without that argument being undermined. So the first thing I'll say is that until you really refute the arguments that are there, but not refute just in the pure Cato language, but I mean refute, what's, I just forgot the professor who wrote the book, The Language of Politics. Maybe it's yours, Mason. Arnold Kling? Yes, clean. That's it. Yes, clean. Where he says that you need to speak the language of politics and speak the language that the people will understand. So if you're talking to a libertarian, you need to talk freedom. If you're talking to a Democrat, what? Speak progressive, speak, uh, speak social justice. Speak to a conservative, you speak, I forgot what he said, but like speak, okay, conservatism for the country, whatever um, kind of thing. So uh, until you speak the language that the people understand, uh, I think it's going to be tough to make inroads. And then the second thing I said is confuse them. And uh, I'll give an example. I, and I don't remember if it was the governor of Virginia, but in the state of Virginia, let's say the government, governor, let's say school board, proposed that, okay, class sizes, teachers are complaining that I can't teach so many students. And he proposed that why don't we pay teachers who are willing to accept more students, pay them a little more. Well, uh, and actually, Darcy, I, I was invited to give a closing address at, at the Head Start conference, and ooh, do they hate you? Uh, <laughs> okay, they don't like David Bowles much either, by the way. Um, but I gave the closing remarks, and, but I, I met with some of the teachers, just talking with them uh, about things, and I mentioned this proposal about paying the teachers more. They were all for it, and they were angry at the union for voting it down. Okay? Internally, they were ready for someone to come up with some proposal that will benefit them, but they only saw the union fighting for them. 
Okay? So my point is that they were confused. Should we be for what the union is for? Or should we be for, I, I won't say governor, uh, what the governor's for, but it was one of those proposals that they had trouble turning down and that they were angry that they didn't get the money. So I think until there are these kinds of reforms where people on the inside have to consider, is this good for me or not? And will I benefit personally? Okay? Or will it be better for the system? So. When was this Head Start conference? Uh, well, the Head Start conference was probably 2003, 2004, and they wanted someone from Cato to come in, and David Bowles wasn't available then, and Darcy had already escaped because they were looking for you, um, and they just asked me to explain, you know, what is Cato's position on Head Start. So I did my best, uh, Dave, but they still hate you. So uh, I'm sure they don't still hate you, though. That's why I asked. Is I don't want people to think that the animosity is still there. They hate Colleen, I guess, if anybody, because she's still doing it. Uh, so, Todd, what do you think the next 20 years in higher ed, and what should we be focusing on to try and, I guess, avert disaster or maybe even make things good? Well, I believe it's uh, that I usually hear attributed to the economist Herbert Stein, uh, something that can't go on forever won't. Um, and that's clearly the case with higher education, right? It can't, get, the costs can't keep going up like this while the value either stays the same or goes down. Um, now, the problem, but, but that reality, um, there's a big gap between wishful thinking and that reality. There's a big path between here and there. Why is that? Now we're in the realm of public choice. Uh, and the like, which is the practicalities of unwinding uh, this particular system, right? So far, the impulses are moving the opposite direction. The impulses are towards more, you know, subsidizing universities on the front end and then subsidizing it on the back end by forgiving student loan debt and the like, which universities will just will relieve any pressure on universities to stop increasing costs uh, in doing uh, in doing things like that, right? So, so that's where they they want to take this. But I see there. So there are a lot of things that should transform higher education. It's obvious to anybody that the internet should have a transformative effect on higher education. One thing that's quite striking to me observing this is a lot of people thought maybe the pandemic would have a um, be sort of a watershed moment for sort of innovation in higher education. As far as I could tell, that's not the case at all, that it's going right back to business as usual. Um, we're talking about an industry in which they completely shut down the universities, made everybody go online, prohibited them from entering the gyms, uh, the libraries, and the cafeteria, and then still charge them the exact same amount of money uh, that they were, were charging. I mean, this, this is an industry whose ethics would make a short seller on Wall Street cringe, uh, uh, the kind of way that these guys vacuum up uh, uh, money. And there's two big problems here, which is one is, let's be serious, uh, um, uh, uh, progressive politicians like the fact that universities have become indoctrination mills, right? And so they support what universities do and what is being taught at universities uh, uh, and the like. It's an in-kind sort, of, uh, um, sort of subsidy for what they do. And the amount of money in higher education is astonishing. There are like trillions of dollars involved in higher education. Just think about the buildings. Think about the real estate. Think about the salaries. Think about how many small towns in America, the university, the local university is one of the biggest employers uh, in that they generate big dollar jobs and small dollar jobs and high income students who uh, support the local economy and, and, and the like, right? And higher education knows this. So if you look at, for example, yeah, if you look at don't you can like look at uh, um, political support like donors, right? Like on uh, Open Secrets, and they'll rank. You have to list who your employer is when you donate to a political campaign. I think of the 12 largest donors to Barack Obama's presidential campaign. Seven of them were universities. Harvard University, no, California University system was number one. I think Goldman Sachs was number two, and Harvard employees were number three and so on down the list, right? Th th this is an incredible economic clout that these guys have. They have huge lobbying operations and the like. And so, um, and so what I think what we can do uh, 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 in our world 
is to continue to point out, continue to do the good sort of studies that show that what makes college unaffordable is all this federal intervention. Keep pushing for more competition. Keep uh, uh, um, and be conscious of the factors that are driving this, such as the factors are driving over credentialism uh, and inflating demand uh, uh, for uh, for higher education, um, and just kind of keep pointing out the, the um, inefficiencies and the waste in the system uh, and hope that that eventually catalyzes people to wake up uh, to, uh, to start attacking these, these underlying fundamental problems and overcoming this huge political resistance that will need to be overcome. All right, thank you. So we're going to now go to question and answers. We have people, again, who are uh, online, people who are here. If you have a question you're here, of course, raise your hand. I'll call on you and just ask for you to wait for the microphone. We also have a number of questions and comments that are online that I'm ready to get to. But as a reminder, if you do want to send something, you can send it on any platform uh, that you're watching on. Uh, if I take your question or comment, you get one of these commemorative Cato CEF at 20 collapsible mugs, ideal for camping or other needs. Um, and uh, just send us your email address or your, um, your snail mail address and we'll make sure that we get one of those sent out to you. Um, I'm going to start with a question from Eben. I hope I'm saying that name right. Um, and Eben says, what have been the benefits and drawbacks of vouchers in DC since school choice was implemented? And in particular, this is a great question, what states have been the most successful with their school choice programs? So uh, Colleen or Casey, do you want to, one of you take the first question, which the benefits and drawbacks of vouchers in DC? And then you can go right into the second question if you want, which is which states are the models? So for DC, Casey, you're definitely more the expert than I am. Most of my knowledge comes from the Miss Virginia movie. Uh, okay, I haven't been paying attention, um, so I have to go back to the past. And when the bill was passed, um, and we talked about the possible benefits, one benefit which maybe a lot of people don't appreciate is that the kids will be in safer schools. Okay? And that it was actually a concern for many of the parents at that time that they were in schools that were unsafe and they could get their kids in the safer schools. Second thing is that they could get their kids into learning environments with other kids who were really motivated. That a lot of them were concerned that they were in schools that you know the educational level wasn't as high and that their kids were being held behind because of whatever, bullying or um, just uh, peer pressure uh, not to study. Uh, and that was the second benefit. And then the third benefit, and kind of what we talked about a bit earlier, the fact that they knew that the money was following them and that they could show up at schools and say, okay, my child you know, has what, at that time it was a, up to $7,500. Um, and that the parents were really motivated and they felt like for the first time that they had real power uh, within the system. So those were the benefits at that time. Now, I don't know, because I'm not paying attention to the, to the program, so you'd have to talk about the current situation. So when I think about the success of a school choice program, I, I, don't, I just don't think there's one measurement you can really use, which is kind of the whole reason why we need these types of programs, because all kids are different and their needs are different. So for the DC scholarship program, just the fact that it is still there and it's getting funded every year and people are still clamoring for it is to me an indicator that it is serving the needs of the people that are using it. I think when we look around the nation, you know, Florida is definitely one of the leaders in these programs and they've got a number of different scholarship programs somewhere between I believe 40 and 50 percent of kids in Florida actually don't go to their assigned district school which I think is a measure of success because that means that those kids are able to find a better education that works for them versus just going to the school that they're assigned to. Another thing that has been interesting to see in Florida is as their education savings account programs have been around longer, parents are customizing it more. In the early days, it was mostly used for tuition at private schools, and now it's much more parents are picking and choosing different providers to serve different needs of their kids. 
And then, of course, in 2011, 2021, we had West Virginia pass a near universal ESA. And then just this year, we had Arizona pass a completely universal one. And I think a lot of these are driven by parents who they realize now more than ever that you know, the, their kids' needs may not be met by the school that they happen to live near. And so they're pushing for these, and lawmakers are listening to them. And I, I think that that in, itself, in and of itself is a measure of success, the fact that there is increased demand for these and that the politicians are listening to that demand. And let me just add one more thing. Um, going into the cobwebs of my mind, uh, there was research by Patrick Wolf uh, on the DC Voucher Program, and he compared the the, uh, the kids that received the vouchers and those who did not. And that he found that those who received the vouchers were more likely to go to college, that they were also, whatever, they had um, whatever higher grade point averages and a higher percentage of them graduated from school. So there's, I think his research was around 2010 or so. So I think about after five years after the program had been in existence. Mm-hmm. Well, and DC is actually a good example of one of the most consistent research findings is that more competition, so a public school with more chosen schools around it, tends to improve because of competition. And DC actually has a lot of competition. So there are the charter schools, there's the voucher program, and there's the fact that if people don't like the education in DC, they can still work here and move to Maryland or Virginia. So we've actually seen a lot of improvement in DC, at least test scores and those kind of outcomes. And a lot of that is probably a function of a whole lot of competition for their public schools. Um, Again, if anybody in the audience has a question, just raise your hand, we'll get you a microphone. Uh, We've got a lot of uh, questions online. This one is, I think, probably geared at K through 12, but it also applies to higher ed and maybe applies to higher ed even more. Uh, the, unfortunately, the person is anonymous, so I, don't, I can't give their name, but they say over the last 30 years, billions have been spent on quote-unquote distance learning at virtual schools. And I think in higher ed, even before COVID, there were a fair number of people taking online classes. Well, they say, why wasn't our national educational system better prepared when the pandemic happened? Why haven't we been able to develop a hybrid model, hybrid model that would suit most students? So I'd be interested to hear about that in K through 12, why we weren't ready and why higher ed seemed to be totally caught flat footed by this. Well, I think a lot of it for K-12 is just a resistance to change. Anytime you have a big system and a bureaucracy, it resists change. And I know in Pennsylvania, we had the cyber charter schools, which Pennsylvania has one of the most robust cyber sectors. They reached out to the districts. They offered, you know, when COVID hit, they, they offered their help to help them get their programs up and running, to help them do a better job with it. And I don't believe any districts took them up on it. Some of the brick and mortar charter schools did, some of the private schools did, but I don't think any of the district schools did. And I think it's because district schools, a lot of times, they seem to see it as kind of a, a fixed pie. And if they cooperate with these other providers, then they're going to lose students, whereas a lot of times I think the private sector or the schools of choice view it differently, and so they do seem to cooperate more from from what I've seen. So I I think that that's a lot of it, like in Pennsylvania also, where our district schools a lot of times are trying to, they have their own little online schools, but they're not a full robust school like the cyber charters are. So they're just trying to do it to save money and to keep the students there versus a, an independent online option that is designed to meet, like fully meet the needs of the kids. So I, I think it's a lot, it's bureaucracy and a resistance to change. What about in higher ed? It seemed like higher ed should have been prepared. <laughs> It was not. It should have been. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a good question, and um, it's one we're looking at at my law school because our new dean um, founded a um, online uh, law uh, company and then became our dean. And so we're standing. We're in the process of standing up a systematic hybrid degree, but we're one of the first ones to do that. If my impression is that a primary reason is accreditation. Uh, uh, that accreditation um, is a very inputs focused model in higher education, which is you've got to waste money on libraries and how many carols you have and um, you know study rooms and like all this stuff uh, that is really 
Un, largely unrelated to quality of education, but very related to creating barriers to entry against new uh, co firms, you know, new universities coming in with a different business model. So I think there has been an a active effort to suppress um, serious online education, higher education through the accreditation um, system. Um, the second thing is, is that universe, right? The accreditation is this kind of racket where the accreditors are composed of the universities and then the accreditors regulate the universities that basically, you know, accredit them, right? So it goes back and forth. So I think the other thing is, is more and more the business models of higher education um, has been to sell uh, these amenities like food and housing. And so um, there, there's a very strong desire um, to, uh, to, uh, to suppress online competition from higher education, basically, because the, the business model still very much depends on having a lot of people on campus paying for all this real estate and all this fixed capital that they've accumulated uh, over time. And so, um, so, I think, so I think accreditation protects them from innovation. Uh, at the same time, it um, dampens the need for universities to innovate, like any industry, right? Uh, which is, you know, imagine uh, General Motors if they could never go out of business uh, or if they were, you know, protected from competition or, you know, that that Kmart never had to worry about Amazon uh, or whatever the case may be, right? Um, that's kind of what higher education is, is that uh, they've, they've protected this industry from um, competition and uh, from online. Um, and um, you get what, exactly what you'd expect from that, which is a highly un innovative business model that looks the same way it did at Cambridge in the 15th century. Okay, here's another question. This one comes from Donald. Uh, I'm not sure what platform he's on. He asks, has CEF addressed the issue of administrative costs in education versus teaching instructional costs and what remedies have been successful in limiting administrative costs? I will say that I don't think at CEF we have spent that we've dedicated a lot to looking specifically at those problems. Um, in part, that is because we're hesitant to say, well, what is the right amount of spending on teaching? What is the right amount of spending on administrative uh, staff? Um, but they're, they're certainly very big problems. We think if we have a free market, those things will work themselves out. But I know that, uh, Todd, you've looked at this, or at least it's in the book, um, and, and I'm pretty sure you've written on administrative bloat and things like that. And Colleen, I, we have, again, haven't looked as much at K through 12, but you may want to say something to that, or maybe not. I don't know, Casey, whether you have anything you want to say, but Todd, I know you've talked about it, so. Yeah, and that's a, and I think that's a function of this subsidy system, right? Uh, yeah, the administration has grown much faster uh, than um, classrooms. Uh, more and more, the way higher education looks like is sort of a medieval guild. Uh, there's a smaller and smaller number of us tenured faculty members who teach less and less and get paid more and more than ever before. Um, and a lot of the classes are taught by you know, by uh, um, non-tenure track um, lecturers and that sort of thing who basically serve at the will of the president. Uh, the presidents of these universities have basically built these empires. Uh, in the book, um, and in my writing on this, um, since we're in the, the hall, we had uh, Bill Niskanen was mentioned earlier uh, in the, uh, the house that Niskanen built. Uh, Bill Niskanen's model of bureaucratic behavior in the government from his 1974 behavior, I think, pretty nicely also captures bureaucratic behavior in nonprofit organizations like universities, which is they're empire builders, right? The way you get ahead in a university is by building your empire, right? Um, you don't have profit and loss statements in a university. Um, and I like to joke, you know, that one bureaucrat in university does work, two bureaucrats hold, the, hold meetings and then hire a third person to do the work uh, is basically uh, what happens. And so if you look at the dysfunctions inherent in nonprofit governance, especially when you have these free cash flow streams from government subsidies, from endowments, all this sort of stuff, you would tend to get the kind of behavior you see, which is empire building by the people who have their hands on the on the budget basically which is the the uh, president uh, and the executive staff mm -hmm. Colin, do you want to say anything well just there's a very common chart that you can see where the the line of students increases you know pretty low or flat and up and down a little teachers go up some but then administrative staff goes up a lot and uh, you know I think that that is because of the funding model 
and I agree that school choice would solve a lot of this, especially education savings accounts, because the money rolls over year to year, so there is an incentive for parents to look for the best priced option, and there's a disincentive for schools to just hire a bunch of administrative staff and keep jacking up their tuition, because parents aren't going to want to do that, because then their funds won't roll over. All right, so if anybody here has any questions, please just raise your hand. We will, oh, we have one right here, and the microphone has just arrived. <laughs> um, just on. I have a, a comment, which is Darcy Olson wrote a great paper on early childhood education back in the day, but if the Head Start advocates are mad at her, these days they should be mad at the Brookings Institution, which has put out a couple of studies uh, showing real problems and real questions about the value of early childhood education. But my question is, I thought maybe the, at least the media high point for CEF was Andrew Coulson's PBS series, and maybe you might want to say a bit more about that. Sure, so his series was School Inc. Um, we have a display of it outside. Unfortunately, I don't think we have the DVDs of it, but you can still, I think, find it, or at least parts of it on Free to Choose Media, um, uh, lots of other places. But his vision was, it, Andrew, uh, turns out, was a big fan of Carl Sagan, and uh, what was his thing again? Oh, why am I forgetting? Cosmos, right, the, and the, the cinematography of Cosmos, um, and he liked documentaries a whole lot, and he said what he would really like to do is do a, a documentary series, and of course, uh, I should have also mentioned Free to Choose with Milton Friedman to combine Sag Sagan Friedman, I guess that Fried Sagan or something, um, and, but put those together to, to have a sort of popular uh, entertaining way of explaining why you want free markets and education, what sort of innovation that will release, release, where it's happening around the world. And so he created this documentary called um, School Inc. Uh, and like I said, we have a display of it uh, outside. Um, it ran on PBS, was it 2017 maybe, I think, somewhere around there. Um, uh, I think it ran a little bit faster than we anticipated, so we couldn't promote it as much. And unfortunately, Andrew was very ill as this was coming to fruition, and it passed, I think, before it ran. Um, we also have a book that explains more of this that's outside, again, uh, that's all about Andrew Coulson's ideas um, and people sort of grappling with it because we would like his ideas to continue on. Um, and I, that was an, an astounding undertaking to do this three-part series that ran on PBS, and uh, the Head Start people, I guess, hate us, and various people in K-12 through hated us. Uh, Diane Ravitch, who you may know, is an education historian, but also had become sort of a major defender of the public schooling system, uh, with some other people said it was, uh, wrote that it was outrageous that PBS would ever run this thing called School Inc. And we had to explain, first of all, sort of how, you know, free society works and freedom of speech and this idea that maybe you could entertain ideas other than your own. Um, but it was really an important work and you can see it uh, again out on the second floor and I think you can still purchase these DVDs. Uh, we just don't have uh, all those. Uh, so that definitely, I mean, almost certainly was the big, uh, our biggest media splash. Um, in terms of the Head Start studies, Colin, you may want to talk about this, but uh, we certainly, that's Grover Russ Whitehurst, goes, Grover Russ is what he usually goes by, wrote a lot of good things at Brookings about the sort of failure of preschool to fulfill its promises. We did a paper with David Armour, who's at George Mason University, now emeritus, on the research and how it doesn't support early childhood education. And then, Colleen, your paper talked about that and? Right, and I think most of the studies, what they find is when the kids get to kindergarten, you know, maybe they're doing better than kids that didn't t participate in any of the programs, but the results tend to fade out pretty quickly, whether it's academic. And some have even shown, some recent studies have even shown harms, both academically and socially, from some of these programs, so. All right, I have one last question I'm gonna try and get to. It's from Chad, and I think we can answer it fairly quickly. It says, should federal funding be provided for school choice? Skepticism is understandable given the federal government's record of poor implementation and or regulatory overreach. 
If the supply of alternative options doesn't meet demand or current funding models, how can we rapidly accelerate supply? Uh, I'll answer the federal one, which is there should not be federal school choice broadly, but it is totally constitutional to have school choice through the federal government in Washington, D.C. And that was the argument at that time. In fact, in within Cato, some people questioned if we should do this or not. And um, David Bowles is here. He can ask and anyone probably, but as I recall, the point was that Congress has legisl uh, has authority over Washington, D.C., so it's perfectly legitimate here. That was the argument at that time. That's right, and that's the argument we continue to make. Okay. So here, uh, we would, uh, at least I would like to see it at, um, at the federal level uh, move for military families because the federal government has authority legitimate constitutional authority over the military, and if it assigns military families to different places, uh, it should allow funding to follow those students. Um, and so we are also clearly in favor of that. And there may be uh, the ability of the federal government to supply school choice to students who are currently in Bureau of Indian Education schools because there we have a treaty authority at the federal level. But other than that, the Constitution doesn't give the federal government any authority to govern in education, and that includes school choice. And then real quick, um, maybe Colleen, you'd want to talk about this. Uh, how can we quickly or rapidly accelerate supply? Well, I think that's happening organically. There's the growth of micro schools and hybrid schools and homeschooling various co-ops and things so it's happening organically and I, I think you know increasing school choice at the state level and making sure that some of the barriers to to education to starting schools whether it's daycare rules or zoning rules things like that I think that's a place where we can look for ways to just make it easier for entrepreneurs to create new environments mm -hmm. All right, well, it turns out we're out of time. So first I want to thank our panelists uh, and Darcy Olson, who's not up here, but who is still here, for joining us today and for your comments. So maybe a round of applause for, for our panelists. Um, I also want to thank anybody or everybody who has supported the Center for Educational Freedom for the last 20 years and the Cato Institute, of course. Uh, especially, uh, I'd like to thank the Gleason Family Foundation, who have been instrumental in supply in providing uh, resources so that the center can continue to do its work. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of the CEF directors, policy analysts, research assistants, uh, and interns everyone who's worked for the center over the last two decades, uh, as well as the tremendous Cato staff that do, does all sorts of things to support our work and everybody else at the Institute. Uh, and with that, I'd like to invite everybody who's here to join us for a reception in the Winter Garden and thank everybody who joined us online uh, for your time, your questions, and your comments. Thank you.